If you would bow down with me, please. Father in heaven, as we worship you today once again, as we're gathered here and, and as well as all the other people in the world that are worshiping you at this season. There's so many, it's so wonderful to, to hear all those uh, songs about you at this time of year, Lord. And, and you're with us since the beginning of this service here. And we ask that you continue to be with us, Lord. Be with us with that power that we sang about. Empower us as we hear the message that will, and I pray that this message will come from you, Lord. And, not, and we are all just uh, instruments that uh, are used by you because of your love. And, and you have a work that you are planning to accomplish here. And so we ask for your empowerment because without, without your presence, Lord, uh, we can do nothing. So we thank you so much for everything, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's really interesting that uh, there's a lot of hymns already that we're singing about Jesus Christ. And, and as I was you know, planning for a message today, since it's the Christmas season, it was interesting that I learned that there was a new, uh, there's a hymn that was used by the early, early church. And it's found in the New Testament. And this hymn, actually, the interesting part about it is this hymn, the Apostle Paul used this hymn to admonish his congregation. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this hymn. And I never learned that, never realized that this was a hymn. And that's why, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, uh, God is so wise because he blesses other people like you know those textual experts and uh, and uh, scholars and they study the word of the bible and uh, a lot of them have come to a conclusion that this passage that we're going to be studying today was a hymn we don't know who composed it we don't know the tune we don't know the title but if I was to put a title to this hymn, I would entitle it, The Spirit of Christmas. That would be the title that I would put to this hymn. And, and this hymn would be found in Philippians chapter 2. And the specific hymn starts in verse 6 to 11, actually. But we'll, we're going to be covering 5 to 11, Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. And this was Paul addressing the congregation in Philippi. And uh, let's look at this now. Let's look at the, the passage. Philippians 2, verse 5. He said, Having this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, in verse 6, Philippians 2, verse 6, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we see here, he starts off, the song, this hymn starts off already with the Christmas message right? Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. Isn't that the Christmas message? God became man, right? So the question for us today is, okay, that's good news. That's great news, right? So, what does that have to do with me today? How is that relevant for my day-to-day -day life? Because that's what preaching is all about, right? That's why we stand up here and, and expound the message so that we can learn something that will apply to our daily lives. So, what, what can we get from this passages? Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. So what was Paul trying to bring out here? What was his purpose in bringing this out? Well, if you go back to verse 5, he said, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have this attitude. He's saying, have this mindset. Have this mindset, which was also in Christ <coughs> Jesus. So what was the mindset of Jesus Christ that compelled him to, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What compelled him to empty himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made into the likeness of man? What was that kind of mentality? Humility. humility. That mentality is uh, humble service. Humble service. It's because of humble service that he did not regard equality with God. He took on the human form. And that shows us that here on this passage, uh, most of the common concepts before that I thought when I was growing up hearing about the Christmas, Christmas message was that, you know, here's God the Father, the boss, you know, and said, hey, uh, Jesus, since you're only my son, you're going to be the one going to, the, to earth. You're going to be human, you know, and uh, you'll die for people's sins. But here it shows that it was Jesus Christ who volunteered. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He just said, I'll, I'll let this go. And he became human. So what can we learn? How can we, as, hum, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, how can we have this mentality of humble service? How can we have this mentality of humble service? We can learn a lot from here, from these scriptures. There are three aspects, from what I can see here, that are involved in having an attitude and a mentality of humble service. The first point would be having that attitude of being able to you know, set aside our rights for the benefit of others. Jesus Christ had every right to stay as God, right? He had every right to say, hey, I, I don't have to do this. He is God. He can do everything. When, when man fell, so, you know, quote, fell, he could have said, you know, it's true that I said uh, the penalty of sin is death, but I am God. I can override that ruling and say, no, I'm just going to give them grace, and that's it. I don't have to become human, and I don't have to die. But he is true to his word. He is sincere. He declared it, and he said, no one is big enough to pay for the penalty of sin, so I will set aside my rights. I will set aside my godly character or go godly existence, part of it, and embrace the fullness of weak humanity for the purpose of redeeming them back to God. So that's the one characteristic that we can think about. Are we people that are willing to set aside our rights for the benefit of others? It's so easy. I mean... Uh, the mentality of today's world is if you're the boss, you are the one supposed to be served. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? You know, I've got to work my, my way to the top so that all the peons will do the work. And I'm going to be the one to be served. But here, and they, and they have every right. Because, hey, you, earn, you, you, know, you worked hard and, and you earned your way to the top. And so you have every right to just sit there in your office and do nothing. 
But what was Jesus' example? He is God. He said, I will set this aside. I'll set aside all my rights so that I can serve humanity. I can serve humanity. Setting aside your rights to serve for the benefit of others. And we might say, yeah, uh, I can do that, right? It's, but then again, uh, a good way to, to check ourselves is, uh, have you ever been on a, an intersection, you know, in the traffic light? And then you're on a two-way road, and you're on the fast lane, right? And then here's another car. On the other end of the traffic light is one lane. And so you have a car right on your side here, and you're saying, wow, you know, I have the right of way, right? I got the right of way, so now it turns green. So your tendency is, wow, I'm going to go ahead because I have the right of way. But as the case always every day, I, I, I experience this every day when I come to work, and the reason why I'm saying it. The tendency is the one on your right speeds up. And the temptation is, hey, I have the right of way. I'm going to go ahead of you. you should, you're supposed to stop. Right? But the best way to do it is set aside your right so that the other person will be ahead and avoid a collision at the same time. And, and do you feel good about it? Honestly, for me, I would not feel good about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to warn you, all these points are kind of hard to swallow. But what is Paul saying in verse 5? What is Paul saying? Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have this mentality in yourself, this mindset, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we must be able to set aside our rights for the benefit of others when it benefits others. It doesn't mean that we give up our rights because there are times when we are supposed to stand up, especially for the right uh, when it comes to the kingdom. But when it's really beneficial to others, those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Are we really ready to set aside our rights so that others will be benefited? And then the next point that I, I can learn from here is, are we people who are willing to take on inconveniences and even hardships? and even hardships, so that others will benefit. What did Jesus Christ do in verse 6 and 7? He existed in the form of God, but did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of that death, but that, that, that wasn't enough, even death on the cross. And so a lot of times we read through that so fast and we don't grasp it, but what Jesus Christ actually did was he, didn't, he, he not only came down as a human, a full human being, and not only die, but he died the death of the cross. Now, maybe it won't come clear to us if we don't really look up the history of the cross. The cross is reserved for the very worst criminal in that time. The cross is reserved for the very worst criminal at that time, and no one wants to be put on the cross. The Jews hated the cross. It's like a curse from God if someone was put on the cross. The Romans, they don't even want to think about it. I, in fact, I was looking at uh, a piece of uh, history here where 
Cicero, he's a lawyer, Roman lawyer, he was defending uh, Rabirius. He was accused, of, these, these are Romans. He was accused of uh, extortion, but actually not, because what, what he did was he, he lent some money to uh, Ptolemy the, the 12th, he's a king, and the king refused to pay him, and he was you know, asking, hey, pay me up. And the king said no, and uh, the Roman government uh, got Rabirius, and, and they accused him of extortion, so Cicero uh, defended him. And this is like a long treatise, and it was written down in, in Latin, but I found an English uh, translation, and, and in one point, he said, the mere name of the gibbet, gibbet is a form of crucifixion, or crucifixion is a form of a gibbet, should be far removed not only from the persons of Roman citizens, but also from their thoughts and eyes and ears. This is how terrible crucifixion was. But what did Jesus Christ do? He went that low to redeem us. You know, we, what did God say? The penalty of sin is death, right? So he could have just come here as a human being, right? Lived 32 years and uh, died of a natural cause. Then it would still be a penalty of sin, right? But no. He chose to show up and enter the fullness of humanity when this form of execution was in place. He could have come today and died and even took the penalty of, of uh, criminals, which is injection, which is not, you know, we, now we consider it inhumane. But what about crucifixion? Crucifixion is not only intended as torture, it was also intended as humiliation. What it is, when we see those pictures today, we see partially clothed, but normally what they do for those that are crucified, they strip them naked. Everything is showed so that he, the person would be totally humiliated. Just imagine, Jesus Christ chose that type of death for us. So. When we talk about the king is born, it's nice to see that. But you can see the depth of his mentality, of his mindset, of being a humble servant. Being a humble servant. And we can ask ourselves, are we willing to endure inconveniences and even hardships for the benefit of others. And then on the third point would be, are we people who are voluntarily doing this, not by compulsion? Are we willing to do this voluntarily and not by compulsion? As you can see, verse 6, right? Although he was and he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God. He was willing to pour out himself. At first, when I first read this, I thought he gave up his, his, his uh, deity. But if you really read the total meaning, it means pouring out. He totally poured out himself. He poured out himself for humanity and embraced, embraced the fullness of humanity. So he was fully man and fully God at the same time. Please don't ask me to explain that. But he emptied himself voluntarily. God did not, God the Father didn't say, hey, you, you're, you're, you're only my son, you should die. He volunteered. And then I was thinking, so that means God the Father really got it made. Because he, just, he was just up there in some ways that I can't explain, and Jesus Christ is down here, dying and, and, and suffering for us. But then after I thought about it, I said, wait a minute, you know, uh, people that don't have kids probably won't understand this, but I would, if it was me, uh, the father, it would be harder for me to watch my son being persecuted like that. So the, the father actually in reality suffered more 
if you can even explain that, how, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in anthropomorphic ways, or I guess, like in human terms. So the father and son, their sacrifice is great, if we really look at it. And it, it's so easy to say, yeah, the father sent the son, and he died on the cross. But if you really look at the nitty-gritty of the nuts and bolts of what really happened, I hope it'll sink in. And the mentality behind it, which I call the spirit of Christmas, is humble service. That was the motivation of everything here. That's why we even have Christmas. That's why he even became a human being. Died the worst, the worst form of death. Yeah. Today, yeah, like I said, today we call lethal injection inhumane. Wow, just think about the crucifixion. Just think of all the inconveniences that Jesus Christ had to, you know, to uh, experience. He was God. He didn't have to eat and then, you know, clean himself up and sleep and, and get tired. But he was willing to embrace the fullness of humanity. Now he had to sleep. Now he had to be born as a baby. Now he had to be trained and had to grow up. He had to take a bath and, and go to the restroom and, and everything else that comes with humanity. A king is born, yes. King is born. But with a mentality of humble service. So what was the result of what he did? What was the result of what he did? Verse 9. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus every knee would bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. See? So what happens? He humbled himself to the lowest point, and God the Father exalted him above every other name, and gave him what name? At first I said, I thought it was the name Jesus. But if you really look at it, he gave him the name Lord. Lord means head above all. And in studying this scripture, it shows us the kind of hierarchy that God's system of government is. And it's actually a paradox, or it's contradictory to our form of government. Wherein the higher your rank is, the more you're going to be, you need to be served and, and do nothing. But in God's hierarchy, the more, the higher your rank is, the more you will humbly serve. The more you will humbly serve. And for us probably saying, well, I wouldn't want to be in, in God's kingdom then. Because, you know, the only way to move up is to serve more. Right? That's with our human mentality. But if you experience that kind of government with the help of the Holy Spirit, because all the principles that we talked about today, I don't think we can do it on our own. It takes the power of Jesus Christ. It takes the mind of Jesus Christ. But if you allow that mind to work in your lives and, and, and work with your mind, you will experience how it is to have that inner fulfillment and inner joy by serving, by serving. And that's probably why God creates. That's probably why he loves people. That's why he serves, because the more you serve, the more you will be fulfilled. And in a way, in a godly way, your rank becomes higher. You will be exalted. It's hard to explain. That's why it's a paradox. And that is the form of government that God is, there's a divine law wherein you, when you humble yourself, you will be more exalted. 
humble service. And I believe this is the true spirit of Christmas. Amen. So I hope that uh, all of us will have, you know, that force will be awakened in us, the force of Jesus Christ, so that we can humbly serve. Amen? Amen. Amen.